Right, as we've topped the 100 mark, which is very impressive, uh, we'll get started. First of all, thank you for joining this Tonkin and Taylor webinar, where we'll be exploring some of the practical realities of, of scenario planning for climate change and looking more deeply specifically at global reference scenarios. Um, but before we get stuck into the content, I'd like to hand over to, to James Hughes for a welcoming uh, karakia. Thanks, Betty. Uh, kia ora tato, nā mihi nui, kia koutou katoa. Uh, just open us with a karakia. Uh, kia ora te marino, kia whakapapa, paunamu te moana, hei huarahi mā tato i te rangi nei, aroha atu, aroha mai, tato i a tato katoa, haumie huie taiki e. Kia ora. Back to you, Perry. Thank you, James. If you want to maybe pop that on the screen as well. Yeah, so thanks again for joining us. Uh, my name is Paddy Pringle and I'll be your, your host today. Um, I'm a principal consultant in climate change risk and adaptation at Tonkin and Taylor, and I've worked in the, in the adaptation space for about 15 years. And I've been lucky enough to work across Europe, Africa, and most recently in the Pacific, where I was based in Samoa, um, working with Pacific Island countries on a, on a range of different um, climate science and adaptation issues. And I joined Tonkin and Taylor earlier this year, and I now work alongside James, leading our work on climate change risk and adaptation and, and also climate disclosures. And one of my greatest interests, I guess, and my, my passions in working in the climate change space has been how we make science useful for decision makers. I think often a lot of the investment can be in the science and we don't always think about how we then apply that and make that usable for, for, for busy people. And that's very much what the theme is today about how do we apply some of these scientific concepts and these scenarios in a, in a practical way that can aid decision making. So I'm, I'm delighted to be joined by our two, two main speakers today, Dr. Andy Reisinger. Um, so Andy uh, was vice chair of working group three on, on mitigation of the intergovernment panel on climate change, the IPCC, uh, for its sixth assessment report, which, which concluded earlier this year. And that's a really crucial and, and vital uh, body of work. He previously served as the IPCC coordinating author for focusing on impacts and adaptation for, for New Zealand and Australia. And he's also currently one of eight commissioners uh, for the New Zealand Climate Change Commission. Uh, prior to this, Andy served as a principal scientist on climate change for the Ministry of Environment and was also deputy director of the New Zealand Agricultural Greenhouse Gas Research Centre, uh, where he focused on international research um, collaboration to reduce agricultural greenhouse gas emissions. So Andy brings a wealth of experience of, of reference scenarios, what they are, what they can do, maybe what they can't do and, and how to use them. So we'll be hearing from Andy um, throughout the session. So thank you very much for joining us, Andy. Really appreciate that. Um, and our other, other colleague, my other my colleague and my other speaker today is James Hughes. Uh, James leads TNT's climate change and resilience practice and has been involved in a, in a wide range of climate um, risk and adaptation projects in recent years. He was heavily involved in the, the National Climate Change Risk Assessment and has also undertaken a wide range of, of uh, climate risk assessments for both the private and the public sector. And he's also led the development of the New Zealand guidance for local climate change risk assessments. Uh, but over the last few years, James has really been beginning to grapple with these issues of, of how we apply scenarios and developing bespoke approaches, approaches for scenario planning and adapting um, traditional scenario planning approaches from, from other disciplines and applying those in the climate change context. So he's got some real practical experience of how we put these scenarios to work. So we'll be hearing from James as well in, in later. Uh, just a few uh, housekeeping points before we get stuck into the content. Um, the length of this session is, is an hour and a half, so we'll run to, to 1.30 and we'll stick to that because we appreciate you're all very busy people and, and very much appreciate the time you've, you've given to join us today. Uh, the format will be hearing from our two speakers and after each presentation we'll have a Q&A, um, a chance to, to kind of explore some of the things you've heard and, and ask questions. Uh, and then possibly if we have time, also some further discussion at the end to to kind of bring the, the concepts together a little bit more and, and think what it all means for our for our everyday lives when we're applying some of these these concepts. Uh, if you could please also be aware that this session will be recorded. Um, so anything you do say may be, may be recorded in evidence and uh, we'll also make that available to you guys so that if you need to step out or you want to share it with colleagues, that's that will obviously be made available so we can share it more widely. <laughs> 
Um, when it comes to asking questions, our preference is to use the Q&A function just because we've got a, a wonderful take up of, of people. So we might have quite a few questions, I suspect. Um, but if not, you know, raise your hand. That's also fine. The raise hand functions there. Um, so we can do it that way as well. But ideally, if, you, if you're OK with that, use the, the Q&A function. Um, if you have burning questions that we don't get to or don't you don't feel we we managed to answer fully, please do email us. We're, we're all very nice, approachable people and, and happy to to engage on, on answering your questions later. So just drop us a line if you if you think of something afterwards or you, we don't get to your question. Uh, and please also, if you could mute, um, if if you do take the floor and, and ask directly, please do mute afterwards so we don't hear everybody eating their lunch. Um, yeah, so that's pretty much it in terms of, of housekeeping. Just a few, I guess, a few reflections for me before we we hear from our speakers. Um, I guess we're in we're in quite an interesting space at the moment here in New Zealand with new legislation that now makes climate related disclosures mandatory for a range of sort of financial market participants, both in the private and the public sector. So there's a, a lot of organisations are really beginning to sort of grapple with these approaches and the assessment steps and what, what's going to be required as part of the the climate related disclosure standards. So a, we're in a quite a new and evolving field here. And these include these standards include uh, scenario development and analysis and we're seeing a kind of flurry of, of activity uh, both in terms of sector and entity level scenarios being developed and it's kept James and I pretty busy this year as well kind of supporting organizations to to do this kind of work and we, we're really seeing it's it's both intellectually interesting but but challenging to 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 do so this is one reason why it's a useful time to reflect on these things so these these entity level scenarios need to be nested within global reference scenarios. Um, and as we're here, there's a number of different types of scenarios uh, with different assumptions that we need to be aware of. And we need to think that through how those then would be applied in the, these global scenarios applied to the New Zealand context and then on to specific sectors and organizations. So we, what, what we're finding is it's, it's, a, it's a complex process. Um, and given this kind of dynamic environment we're working in, this this new policy environment, but also um, new, new um, regulatory environment, we're kind of grappling, we all seem to be grappling with very similar issues. So it's a really opportune time to reflect on exactly what we're learning as we do and and about and where we go next with developing and applying scenarios. So that's that's enough for me, I think. Um, what I'd like to do is now hand over to our first speaker, to Andy, who'll provide his perspective on what reference scenarios are, um, some of their uses and their limitations. So over to you, Andy. Thanks, Paddy. And and Koto. I'll just try and share my screen, which you should be seeing now. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll talk about reference scenarios, mainly at the global scale, and more the conceptual uses and limitations. And then obviously James will talk much more about what they actually mean in practice in application to at entity level in, in Aotearoa, New Zealand. Um, so I'll, I'll briefly try and give some context for scenario analysis, talk about different types of scenarios. I'll talk in some detail about the so-called shared social economic pathways or SSPs and the whole zoo of mitigation scenarios that derives from them. I'll give some comparison of those with other reference scenarios used in sort of scenario analysis and disclosures like RCPs, NGFS, IA. It's a whole acronym soup out there. So I'll try and give some clarity to that and finish with a couple of comments and reflections on how we then apply these global scenarios to New Zealand. Um, so just to get started, I wanted to remind us what a scenario actually is what's shown on the screen is the definition of scenario by the ipcc by the intergovernmental panel on climate change um, a scenario is a plausible description of how the future may develop based on coherent and internally consistent set of assumptions about key driving forces such as rate of technological change prices and relationships Note that scenarios are neither predictions nor forecasts, but are useful to provide a view of the implications of developments and actions. So just as a reflection, so some key operative elements of that definition are scenarios are not a case of making shit up and having fun while you're doing it. The, the need for coherent and internally consistent assumptions is a really important part. It's to think through implications of an assumption made in one area about other areas that, that you may not have thought about. And the other, for me, important part is that scenarios 
are not forecasts. They're not a prediction of how the world will be. They are tools to make us think. And I think that's a really important part of how we then use scenarios as part of scenario analysis. Um, just quick context, stepping back, um, I'll, 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 some, some more cynical reflections. Um, that chart that I've just put up is an assessment commissioned by the World Economic Forum on key global risks um, ranked by likelihood on the horizontal axis and impact on the vertical axis. That's an assessment that was put out in January 2020. Now, without squinting too hard, I encourage you to find where they placed the risk of a global pandemic in early 2020. Don't squint too hard. It didn't make the cut. Um, another famous example is forecasts of solar PV deployment by the International Energy Agency. The blue lines are forecasts is issued at different times by the, by the agency out to 2025 to 2030 to 2040. And the orange line is the actual rate of deployment. And lastly, um, that chart shows in purple forecast fossil fuel exports of coal from Australia issued by the Department of Industry. And the green dashed line are the actual exports over time. So without wanting to, to, to put the boot in too much into those um, charts, what they really tell us is that we suck at scenarios. And having expertise is no mitigating factor to that. We have to work really hard to overcome our institutional, our historical biases and anchoring effects, our groupthink, in order to make scenarios useful to enable us to think about the future. And so I think that's a key theme of what challenges us in scenario analysis. Um, so what type of scenarios are we talking about when we use scenarios as part of climate related disclosures and risk analysis? There's a whole range of things that scenarios can describe. And it ranges from descriptions of future socioeconomic conditions, such as population, GDP, emissions pricing policies, trade, etc. It could be scenarios of global greenhouse gas emissions. It could be scenarios of greenhouse gas concentrations, of global temperature change, such as what if the world reaches three degrees in the year 2100? Or it could be climatic impact drivers, the stuff that actually confronts us with potential damages like heavy rainfall events. What if heavy rainfall doubles in the next 20 years? What if sea level rises by half a meter by 2050, et cetera, et cetera? So you can see that different scenarios go, go down the cause and effect chain from driving forces to what we're actually confronted with. And each one of them can be useful scenarios, but they obviously tell us different elements of the cause effect chain. And of course, because there's a cause and effect chain, uncertainty grows. If you specify socioeconomic conditions, you leave a wide range of potential climatic outcomes. Whereas if you specify global temperature change, you're looking at a, at a far narrower range of actual climate change impacts than if you only specify socioeconomic conditions or, or actual greenhouse gas emissions. Um, so that's just important to keep in mind. What range are we covering by setting different scenarios? Also worthwhile reflecting on that, of course, the full range of drivers may be relevant for um, physical risk assessment. Obviously, we care ultimately about the climatic impact drivers. What about a change in heavy rainfall, et cetera? But socioeconomic conditions and policies matter for two reasons. One, because they give rise to climatic impact drivers, but also because they shape the society that's being impacted and that can better or worse respond to those impacts. Whereas the range of matters that are relevant for transition risk tend to be lower. They tend to be more about the socioeconomic conditions and policies and the actual emission pathways that we're confronted with. Um, so SSPs, the so-called shared socioeconomic pathways, are a way of characterizing possible evolutions of the world, starting with simple characterizations of what might global population be like and what might global GDP 
look like over time. I've there's there's five key different SSPs, you know, imaginatively numbered from one to five, and you can see that they obviously differ in their in their assumptions about how global population and global GDP might develop. Um, but there's there's more to it than just the global numbers. They are different storylines of what the world might look like. So SSP one is called the sustainability SSP, where society inherently evolves towards a more sustainability focused um, population, which means lower fertility rates, but also an inherent focus on prioritizing environmental outcomes over say global economic growth and, and how we actually meet the growth. But it also is a scenario where the world is more towards shared values than individual gain. SSP2 is called the middle of the road, which you can usefully place between SSP1 and SSP3, which is a world dominated by regional rivalry, where you have distinct blocks of countries pursuing their own agendas and not collaborating, but rather having divergent objectives. So interestingly, in that scenario, global population rises the most, that's the red line, but global GDP rises the least because the world doesn't actually collaborate, you're not actually engaging in, in, in collective economic benefit. SSP4 is called inequality or road divided, where inequality doesn't just exist in the form of regional rival, rivalry, but also within societies. You have rich elites, you have poor um, downtrodden parts of society, which shapes how we actually progress, even at the national scale, development objectives. And then you have SSP5, fossil fuel development, where basically we milk the planet for, for the fossil fuels and we use those to power our economy, which has the biggest GDP growth, but it has quite a low population growth because you don't need huge amounts of children to further your development goals, you just try to get rich. Now, some important observations are that they obviously would give rise to different greenhouse gas emissions on the left, and different amounts of temperature increase relative to the present on, shown on the right. These are central estimates, they're not showing the full uncertainty coming from physical climate change uncertainties. We are obviously a world that prioritizes use of fossil fuels to fuel economic development has by far the highest increase in greenhouse gas emissions. Whereas obviously the scenario that inherently prioritizes cohesive global sustainability focused growth would have the lowest greenhouse gas emissions and result in the lowest temperature increase. But a couple of really important comments and observations are, these are baseline scenarios. These scenarios all assume that there are no new climate policies relative to when they were developed in 2010, where there was only a scattering of really effective climate policies in place in the first place. And they assume no climate change impacts, not because that's a plausible assumption, it's simply a design of how those scenarios are constructed, which means those scenarios are not characterizations of the real world that we actually find ourselves in, which both has climate policies and has emerging and increasingly you know, important climate change impacts. They are tools to make us think about how policies and how climate change impacts might play out in those worlds. So that's a really important um, thing to get across. and. Of course, partially because of that, um, the Paris Agreement set a goal of limiting global warming to well below two and pursuing efforts to limit warming to 1.5 degrees. So none of those baseline scenarios go anywhere near the objective set by global governments for, for what they want to achieve under, from, from climate change. So the question arises, what would actually be needed to bend the shape of global greenhouse gas emissions such that we would actually reach the goal set in the Paris Agreement. So that's where a really important revision or update to the SSPs was made, where people started to impose climate change targets on the SSP baseline scenarios to say, how would greenhouse gas emissions have to develop based on just pursuing current climate policies or increasingly stringent climate policies such that the world actually achieves limiting global warming to somewhere close to 1.5 or at least below two degrees. And so that's where a new scenario architecture was introduced that marries up SSP. So they still assume type of inherent narratives that the world follows, but combined with objectives to actually reduce greenhouse gas emissions. 
So SSP5 slash 8.5, so the second set of numbers indicates the radiative forcing, or if you like, the energy imbalance imposed by human activities on the global climate. So the black and the red line are baseline scenarios, assuming different global socioeconomic developments and no new climate policies compared to what was basically no climate policies back in the early 2000s. And then a range of scenarios that still assume different socioeconomic developments together with policies that actually achieve either modest or stringent greenhouse gas emission reductions. So that gives rise, rise to the current zoo of SSP slash RCP, which stands for representative concentration pathway scenarios that span a very wide range of climate outcomes, as well as a wide range of socioeconomic developments that reflect both internal socioeconomic structure, as well as climate policies imposed on those worlds. Um, so the intention behind that range of different SSPs is that they help us think through challenges to adaptation, which in that diagram is shown on the horizontal axis, and challenges to mitigation. Obviously, in that previous slide, if you think you're starting from a world that naturally would evolve towards an SSP 5 8.5 world, the challenge to mitigate down to a 1.5 scenario, the green scenario, is much bigger than if you think your starting point is the sustainability focused world. So that's why different SSPs help us think through challenges to mitigation, which goes to more than just the numerical reductions and emissions required, but also the economic structures, the government structures that you would have to overcome. And one of the important conclusions from that work is that if the world follows an SSP3 trajectory of regional rivalry, none of the global models is able to actually limit warming to 1.5 degrees. That sort of world will prove incapable of mitigating emissions enough. So that's the sort of insights we can draw at the global scale. Equally for adaptation, different worlds will struggle differently. And so if the sometimes oversimplifying shorthand is that richer worlds presumably would have greater tools at their disposal to, to deal with challenges to adaptation than worlds that are riddled with inequality, either at the regional scale or also at the national scale. That's a highly simplified story. Again, it's more an illustration. How can SSPs, the philosophy behind them, be useful to undertake risk assessment? Um, I do want to point out that the SSPs, or well, the SSP RCP architecture, is just five marker scenarios, if you like. But the recent IPCC assessment has shown there's a wide number of scenarios that all illustrate different ways in which the world could choose to limit warming to or close to. 1.5 degrees, shown by the thin squiggly gray lines in the diagram compared with a single SSP 1, 1.9 um, marker scenario that's often used as a, as a reference point for what if the world takes concerted actions. And those differences may matter fundamentally for different businesses. They all share common features, like they all envisage rapid reductions in the near term of global greenhouse gas emissions. But there's a lot, a lot of, a lot of detail to it that may, may well matter. Further illustrated by this figure from the recent IPCC report, the different colored bars show the contribution of different sectors to global greenhouse gas emissions. The tall bar is the composition of emissions in the year 2019. The, 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 the smaller bars on the right are the contributions of different sectors at the point when global CO2 emissions reach net zero in different mitigation scenarios. And you can see that there's different ways in which different sectors could interact both by reducing their emissions, but also by generating CO2 removals to reach a collective global goal of net zero CO2 emissions. So again, depending on where you sit in those different sectors, different assumptions of how the world limits warming to 1.5 degrees and how the world achieves at least global net zero CO2 emissions may have a material impact. So there's, an, there's a risk of taking a single scenario and getting it precisely or precisely missing the point that would have mattered for your risk assessment. Quick comparison of SSPs versus RCPs, because there was an earlier generation of scenarios 
just called RCPs or representative concentration pathways. Those were developed in the mid 2000s to late 2000s. And you can see on the right hand side, you, you see the colored bars that show the range of temperature outcome in the year or sort of in the, at the end of the 21st century under the old RCP scenarios. And on the right, under the different combination of SSPs with RCPs. Now, I mean, the broad message you take from this broadly, those scenarios cover a similar span. They do it slightly differently because they make somewhat different assumptions about socioeconomic developments that underpin those scenarios. Also, SSP, RCP scenarios have more updated emissions, whereas RCPs often assumed that the world would start mitigating greenhouse gas emissions substantially, you know, from the early 2010s, which clearly has not happened. But so there's both sim similarities. So depending on the purpose of your scenario analysis, depending on your focus, those scenarios may well be interchangeable or they may not be depending on what matters for your scenario analysis. I also thought it might be worthwhile pointing out some guidance on physical risk assessment tends to refer to the need to use RCP 8.5 to test physical climate risk sort of as a worst case scenario. But also there's a lot of criticism of using RCP 8.5 because it assumes a, co a continued global growth in greenhouse gas emissions from the use of coal and oil, which simply by now is counterfactual because the costs of producing electricity from, from coal is by now greater in many areas than relying on offshore and onshore wind and solar PV. So the growth assumptions built into the emissions of RCP 8.5 by now require more than just giving up on climate policy. They would require continued subsidizing of coal-fired electricity as compared to simply letting the market take its course. And while that's not impossible, um, given you know, some policies and some politicians, that's unlikely to be a consistent global scenario for the rest of the 21st century. But it's really important to point out, if you just take the mid-range of the climate outcome under RCP 8.5, you are sitting well within the range of possible climate outcomes under SSP 370, which is a scenario where the world basically gives up on climate policies but is well within the range of possibility, even though that may be characterized as a worst case scenario. So using the climate of RCP 8.5 is not completely silly, even though using the emissions of RCP 8.5 by now are, are a distinct stretch of the imagination. So that's maybe useful context for how they, how, how they relate and how they relate in different contexts of climate change risk assessment. Another group of scenarios are the network for the greening of financial services, the NGFS scenarios, where so they are scenarios designed specifically for the finance sector to both stress test and test resilience of financial institutions, financial mechanisms. One really important observation is that NGFS scenarios use SSP2 only for their baseline. So I'm, I'm comparing here the range of global population and global GDP projections under the SSP architecture compared with the NGFS scenarios, they all just use SSP tool. But what they also do, and that's shown here by the thin dashed line compared to the thick lines, which are the SSP scenarios, the NGFS scenarios include scenarios, and that's in particular the, the dark blue thin dashed lines, of delayed climate policies where the, work, where the world takes only weak action out to 2030, but then has a holy Mary moment and rapidly accelerates mitigation of greenhouse gas emissions. The physical climate outcome, so the temperature change in those scenarios shown on the right, isn't materially different by and large compared to the range of outcomes under the SSP scenarios but the implications for the transition risk of the very sharp change in greenhouse gas emissions pre precipitated by the rapid change in the policies applied may make a material difference to risk assessment on the transition side. So that's something worthwhile reflecting on. There's a real value in those NGFS scenarios for that purpose. 
But the other thing to keep in mind is that the hothouse scenario of NGFS only just reaches warming of three degrees, which is a lot less than the upper end warming implied by the SSP scenario architecture. So <clears throat> they, they cover a narrow range of climate outcomes, but distinctly stretch the transition risk deliberately. Um, finally, IEA, as you know, produces a whole range of reports on electricity. And despite having backed their solar PV forecast, they are really important reports that go into a lot of detail on the energy system. Um, and I just show some graphs that are in the latest IEA, IEA net zero roadmap report with the update for 2023 that shows envisaged um, changes in greenhouse gas emissions, in energy supply from different sectors, energy demand from different sectors, fuels, cumulative emission savings, um, et cetera. I should also add that all the, I mean, even though I've only shown population, GDP, global emissions and temperature outcomes from the SSP architecture, those scenarios also have a lot of detail of the assumed energy demand under the different assumptions, how the worlds that evolve along different trajectories are likely to meet the energy demand in the absence of climate policies, how they would change if you impose climate policies under different assumptions, how that might evolve over time across developed and developing countries, etc. So those scenarios also provide a lot of detail on energy sources, but also agricultural greenhouse gas emissions, food demand, etc. Finally, these are all global scenarios. We talk about climate change risk assessment, climate change scenario analysis for New Zealand. It's a non-trivial step to go from the world from an SSP XY, so SSP plus RCP combinations, to out here on New Zealand. And I think we underestimate often the importance of that step because you cannot simply assume that the that New Zealand is a carbon copy of the world as a whole. To start with, New Zealand can lead, lag, or run with the global pace of mitigation implied. We're a, we're a sovereign country. We can, can be leaders. We can also be a country that didn't get the memo that the world has moved on. Um, New Zealand could choose to, fo to focus more on incremental and short-term or transformational and, and strategic adaptation. That's our sovereign choice. The world's evolution doesn't dictate how New Zealand might do this. This matters because you can think through New Zealand might produce some emissions intensive products and has emissions intensive industries. Now you can, if you assume the world follows a rapid mitigation pathway, you can say, well, therefore New Zealand has to rapidly scale down production of these emissions intensive goods. But you can also construct a narrative, a narrative that says, yes, the global demand for those emissions intensive goods will shrink, but it will be still vastly larger than what New Zealand can supply. New Zealand could choose to supply those global emissions intensive luxury goods to a discerning affluent group of consumers that demand the highest possible management standards while fully realizing that they're consuming an emissions intensive good. Global trends don't specify how New Zealand might fare in that world. It's worthwhile thinking through different tra trajectories along those lines. Equally, we need to think through who governs our domestic choices that ultimately put constraints on actions by individual entities. Is it our government? Is it our customers in global supply chains? Are we beholden to regional alliances? Or is it more multilateral rules that govern our freedom to operate? And what values simply does out here in New Zealand apply when managing its adaptation choices? Um, how does the collective will and ambition of New Zealand population in 20 years compare with today's wills and choices. And so not because I want to sell it as a, as a good example, there is some work that I was involved in, um, which is the reason why I'm not putting it forward as a good example or as a recommendation, is we thought through there are more than, way, more than one way of how New Zealand could act in a global world. So if you think RCP 2.6 is a world that globally limits warming to below two degrees, this could be a world where New Zealand rides the front wave of, of sustainability, or it could be what we call a techno garden. It could be a globally economically ambitious 
mitigation world that focuses on money and markets to mitigate rather than broader sustainability and environmental values values these have different implications for the operating constraints on entities within new zealand equally rcp 4.5 is a world where that fails to manage the temperature goal of the paris agreement but maybe not by much some warming somewhere above, above two degrees this could be a world that does try to move on and new zealand is kicking screaming dragged along by that world but didn't quite get the memo about the world is trying to do something about climate change but equally it could be a world where new zealand exploits the fact that there's a lot of countries that want to lead change towards mitigating greenhouse gas emissions strategic choices about adaptation and we actually lean into that that market so these are by no means comprehensive outlines of options for new zealand that just illustrate we have to think through what this world what these global evolutions mean for New Zealand and they, don't, they mean more than just one thing. So to finish off just some personal thoughts and I'm coming at this more as an outsider context rather than what this looks like at the coal face of scenario analysis. I would urge you to treat scenario, scenario analysis as an opportunity to stimulate your own thinking and reflection. You can't outsource scenario analysis. We have to work actively to overcome anchoring ourselves in the past to avoid groupthink, even while, crucially, using recent experiences at the entity level as a really important reference point. There are trade-offs between comparability between entities and relevance for individual entities. What matters for one may not matter to others. You want to, want to avoid precisely missing the one thing that would have mattered to your scenario analysis without having a different scenario for each individual entity. And there are trade-offs between considering a wide range of different scenarios. What about this? What about this? What about this? As compared to having, having a small set of scenarios that you work through in detail to really get to the bottom of what they mean. So in sum, there is no way to get it right, but there are ways to make it more or less useful and relevant at the organizational level. So I'll leave it there. I hope it was useful. And just to flag, there's a whole host of not just qualitative information, but also databases that you can use to stimulate your thinking, to look at what do these scenarios actually mean for different um, industries that are of relevance to your assessment. So thanks very much. Thanks so much, Andy. That's a hugely informative presentation and uh, yeah, really gets into the, the guts of some of the issues that we're, we're all grappling with. Uh, there's a couple of questions already in the Q&A, but please do keep them coming. Um, I'll read them out to you, Andy. You'll probably be able to see them as well if you need to, to look at them. Uh, this is a question from Chris. Hi, Andy. Do the SSP scenarios give a good coverage across the full range of possible pathways? If not, how should they be supplemented? Um, depends on what you care about. If you hear about climate change outcomes, I'd say yes, because the world is barely able to have any feasible pathway left to limit warming to 1.5 degrees outright. Almost all pathways involve some degree of temporary overshoot. And the only question is how much. And so the SSP, I mean, SSP RCP scenarios that include the strongly mitigated pathways do include, I guess, the lower feasibility frontier. Um, and on the upper end, you know, um, easily in the sense that they include emissions assumptions that are wildly implausible by now on the on the SSP 5 8.5 trajectory so they do cover I think the upper end what they don't cover is abrupt change so the SSP RCP scenarios all assume a gradual change along consistent narratives and policies they don't include sort of step changes either triggered by global catastrophes or by global realization, holy hell, we must change course now. So the world actually shifting onto emergency footing. And that matters, especially for transition risks, even though it might not change the range of climate outcomes fundamentally. Um, I just see the second question, what's the relationship between scenarios and what New Zealand has set as our mission reduction targets? I mean, that's a that goes back to New Zealand can choose its own way of of how, how it wishes to meet its own emission reduction targets. 
And it goes back to the fundamental point, what's consistent for one country with a global trajectory depends on far more than a linear process. It depends on what we wish to achieve, what we think our degrees of freedom are, and that relates to market access, to consumer pressure, to international agreements, to global prices, to changes in technology, etc. So I think that's really important to keep in mind. Um, I just see another question. How often can we expect these scenarios to be updated or changed? Well, I mean, unfortunately, there will be an update over the next few years because the IPCC is, in, is embarking on its next assessment round, which will be completed by 2030 at the latest. And of course, people who run global climate scenarios want to know, well, what emissions should I assume to run my global climate scenarios? So there will be updates to global climate scenarios, which both recognize the failure to reduce emissions in the recent past globally, but also may make other assumptions about how much do we reduce gross emissions and what do we assume for the deployment of global carbon dioxide removal technologies and processes. So there's those choices to be made. The question is whether those changes are material for entity level scenario analysis. Some of those changes may not be, but yes, they have potential to cause confusion because existing regulation may say, use that scenario. And meanwhile, you're being told you're not up to date with the latest science because the science has moved on, use those scenarios. So there are those choices. And of course, one of the interesting trends will be that there's a very live discussion and I think a growing consensus that assuming the RCP 8.5 emissions is by now no longer a very plausible assumption. As I said, that doesn't mean that the median climate change outcome from RCP 8.5 isn't useful because you could get there just by climate sensitivity being high and the world being unlucky in terms of climate change feedbacks. So there will be an adjustment that because of the, of the limited success of global climate policies to stimulate clean technologies, the very highest emission pathways are by now far, far, far less plausible than they were just 10 years ago. So that change is material, but you have to nuance it. Are you talking about a climate scenario? So the temperature change, or are you talking about the emissions scenario, which is a world with a relentless further rise in global coal consumption, which by now would be so wildly uneconomic as to be stretching the limits of plausibility. Thanks, Andy. There's a couple of more questions uh, flying in, actually. One from Alison, which I've got a lot of sympathy with because we've been grappling with this one. I've never understood how under how how under sorry how un under SSP five the economy looks like it will thrive in the long term. Under that trajectory, all the tipping points will be triggered. Can you explain how a four to five degree future is plausibly still a thriving economy? So that's because those scenarios do not assume any impact of climate change. They basically model a world as if climate change wasn't a thing and then they just look at the greenhouse gas emissions and the consequences to global temperature because we know that climate change is a thing but that world didn't know about it so it's not a plausible scenario of a real world it's a development trajectory on which we which we can actively use to then think through what impacts would that type of world experience um but there's there's a widespread confusion to think that this is a plausible actual world with continued smooth global GDP growth while literally the world's going to hell in a handbasket at that level of warming. Yeah, and maybe a follow up to that one. I mean, how practically would an entity deal with that when they, as, as they develop their scenarios and try and undertake scenario analysis? Do you have any, maybe that's a question for James, but if you've got any thoughts, we could maybe explore Well, that. as I say, it's, it's relevant to think through the sort of world that would have given rise to those rapid increases in emissions is by no means an implausible world, in the sense a world that prioritizes resource exploitation for the sake of economic gain, rather than thinking through voluntarily internalizing environmental externalities. You know, that sort of world description may sound a lot more plausible and familiar than a world that raises up to five degrees without any impact on this global GDP growth. So there is, there's elements, really important elements that are useful to inform scenario thinking. But as I say, there's a growing consensus that 
an RCP 8.5 warming level is relevant for a physical risk assessment, but the emissions implied in RCP 8.5 or SSP 5.85 by now stretch credibility. I mean, there were part of this scenario architecture, which was, you know, agreed by the global research community in 2015, when sadly SSP 585 as a scenario was not off the cards, but it is a credit to climate policy does work if done well, that it's it's by now far less plausible. So it's, it's one of those things which, this is not an easy space, right? There's, the scenarios are not designed and not communicated necessarily to make scenario analysis at entity level easy. And that's just, that's why we need to talk about it, which is what we're doing. All right, thanks. I'm going to actually just skip down to one of the questions because I think it relates kind of to where we were going with that discussion uh, from Natalie. How are people considering the risks of tipping points in the Earth system and the impact on humanity in these assessments? Well, as I say, the scenarios sort of look at climate change, if like only after the effect, only in a post hoc way, they're not actively built in, but so climate models are using those emissions and then say, if you feed me those emissions, what would the climate system look like? And what are the, what, what are the feedbacks of climate change on terrestrial ecosystems? What is the risk of rapid Amazon dieback? What's the risk of the Atlantic overturning circulation? So the Gulf Stream having a rapid shutdown, what would this mean? For food system, etc. So that's being explored, but often using the outputs from climate models, we're still lacking a good feedback of those climate models on the initial scenarios in the first place. So it's always a modification from those reference scenarios rather than having a complete predictive set. And of course, one of the reasons is that the impact of a tipping point would depend on how humans deal with the tipping point which is why there's no single answer to what's the impact. It still depends on scenario and you can, you can assume, I mean, practical adaptation is a good example and James will probably talk about this. Confronted with rapidly rising sea levels, we can choose to build stop banks, which has a devastating impact on ocean ecosystems, you know, coastal ecosystems, especially down the beach from a stop bank, or we could implement managed retreat. That's the same rapid rising global sea level from say rapid disintegration of the West Antarctic ice sheet, but the impact of that depends on societal responses to that tipping point, which then precipitates or might avoid a tipping point for coastal beach ecosystems. So, so you can't get away from an intricate nesting that does involve societal choices rather than sort of just modeling it through, but it's an imperfect linkage. Um, and I think we have to keep that in mind. Thanks, Andy. There's a couple of questions around NGFS. I don't know if you want to address those or whether those are kind of maybe a bit too detailed when you could come about those offline. I don't know if you would like to pick those um, ones so up or... I, I have limited expertise on the NGFS yep. underlying design philosophy. Maybe just to say that, yes, I believe, I mean, also so by the global modeling community throughout, there's been a shift, interestingly, away from really using the full SSP suite of scenarios. A lot of the more recent studies all use SSP2 because they find it more interesting to impose different policy choices on a given world rather than vary the world upon which policy choices are imposed, if that makes sense. So, so basically, that, it's a different way of probing system resilience. And I think that's one of the reasons why people said, Let's not confuse people by, by thinking the world might be different. Let's explore the impact of our choices in a given world. Um, but yes, it does constrain the range of things you deal with because the same policy choice would have different implications if it's if it's imposed on a different world. So so there are there are limits to that. And different integrated assessment models have been used to model the same. NGFS type of scenario, which sometimes gives slightly different answers. So that there's different assumptions baked into different global economic models that are the basis for then projecting what's the actual energy demand in that, what's the what's the financing requirement for renewable energies in that particular NGFS scenario. Different models give you different answers. 
Um, that's probably as far as I can go, but I'm yeah, happy to have a separate follow-up conversation, but I'm, I'm, I'm not a world expert on NGFS scenarios is the short answer. Great, thanks so much, Andy. That's great. Um, I'm just going to wrap up the questions here now. Uh, we'll leave them in the Q&A, the ones we haven't got to, and maybe we'll get back to them after we've heard from James, because I'm just conscious we, we, we're quite tight for time. So we, you're, those questions have not been lost. We'll either get back to you offline or we'll pick them up at the end. James, I shall now hand over to you for, for your presentation. Thanks, Patty, and thanks, Andy. Uh, I'll just share my screen. I can, already, I can already foresee a need for a follow-up webinar on some of these points Andy's talking about, so we should capture them. Uh, I'm hoping everyone can see that. Now, my presentation hopefully is going to uh, dovetail nicely with what Andy's presented, but I want to explore more practically, I suppose, how you can step through scenario planning at a sector or entity level, more at the entity level, uh, and um, you know, build, how do you utilize these global reference scenarios uh, to build bespoke entity level scenarios? And what are some things to think about based on some of the discussions we've been having and challenges and learnings we've had over the past year or two? Um, so I'll quickly cover some context. What is climate scenario analysis at the entity level? Why and when should we use it? Some sort of provocative questions there. Um, and how do we approach scenario planning at the organizational entity level? So at the context side of things, uh, I'm going, I've uh, sourced a few diagrams from the XRB's material, but you know, scenario planning is effectively, as Andy has said, a tool to enhance strategic thinking, it allows you to think about plausible futures. Um, and it underpins, uh, underpinning it is, is this, I suppose, notion that uh, the future of particularly in climate and the climate world is largely undetermined and there's huge uncertainties. Scenario planning has come interestingly, from corporate practice over the last 50 years, and it's been used for planning strategies in many different environments. And so now we're seeing the practice of scenario planning being brought into the climate world and those methods being adopted and modified slowly. So there is a lot of, um, I suppose, learning and methodologies that have existed from the likes of Shell and many others who, who pioneered some of the scenario planning uh, in the early days. And I wanted to also start by introducing this some concepts here. And on the left, you might say, if you're dealing with a world where you've got complete certainty or a level one or two where you've got a clear view of the future or potentially some probabilistic views, I would argue scenario planning isn't necessarily the right tool to use. And you might instead use risk, more traditional risk assessments. Moving to the right of this diagram, you're moving to level four and five where you might have a multiplicity of plausible futures, or in fact, you just don't know what's going to play out. And that's where scenario planning and scenario analysis, I think, provides a useful tool to start grappling with some of those. So I, I find this diagram useful to kind of help test, are we using the right tool for the right, uh, for the right end? And again, from the XRB um, and from other sources, there are... Uh, some things that scenarios are and that they are not. Um, on the left, scenarios are plausible alternative futures. They need to be significantly different views of the futures in order to be decision relevant. Uh, moving down, uh, they need to be specific. Um, they need to be internally consistent. And often they're products of internal insight and collaborative learning. On the right, they're not probabilistic. They're not variations around a single business case and scroll, scrolling right to the bottom, they're not products of external consultants. So as Andy also emphasized, these are scenarios that need to be built by organizations or sectors or, or, or groups uh, for their own ends and using their own insights. They, I also want to just mention, they should challenge conventional wisdom um, and that the outcome, you shouldn't be looking for a perfect scenario. They are not, perfection isn't a good measure of a scenario. And good scenarios aren't necessarily those that play out in the future either. So they're, 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 these are other important points. Um, they aren't plans or policies, but they can support planning and policy development. And lastly, an important point I think is that scenarios require open-mindedness open, open um, and a willingness to challenge accepted wisdom. And that's, that is a challenge when you're in a room with colleagues or stakeholders and you're trying to say, well, you know, what could plausibly occur in this realm? And 
trying to you know grapple with groupthink, as Andy did mention as in in his talk as well. So why do we want to do scenario planning for climate change? And there's a few a number of reasons uh, to understand the range of plausible climate change impacts and test an organization's strategy is key and that's central to the to the climate related disclosures regime and and another reason you might do it is because you need to align with that regime in and of itself um, and interestingly i've pulled out in the bottom bullet point there in yellow that the xrb and the climate disclosure regime requires an, a, a, an analysis of a 1.5 aligned scenario a greater than three scenario and at minimum uh, one other, which is unspecified, and most of you will know that. And on the right, there are just some other reasons why, you know, scenario planning and climate change is important, whether you've declared a climate emergency if you're in local government, um, whether it might be more reputational or deeply embedded within your strategy, um, or ultimately at the bottom there, performance and survival of organisations. So this is this is embedded within the way that many organisations are beginning to do, uh, to develop their strategies. Now, when we're thinking about climate scenarios, we need to understand some of the terminology and some of the types of uh, risks or drivers that can manifest. And they, as hopefully people are aware, fall within a couple of buckets. So there are risks on the left and opportunities on the right of this diagram. And within the risk area, you have transition risks, and physical risks. Physical risks are those that manifest due to the changing climate and could be related to, say, extreme temperatures, sea level rise, uh, extreme flooding, etc. And the transition risks typically uh, manifest through policy and legal changes, technology, market, or reputational drivers that uh, often are related to the rate and pace of decarbonisation and what plays out in, in that sphere. They can also relate to um, uh, policies, for example, in the resilience and adaptation area as well. So moving from drivers on the left, physical drivers, and this is how we might think about linking drivers within a scenario through to risks and opportunities. So you've got, say, physical and transition drivers on the left, and that can lead to a range of potential risks and opportunities for an organisation. And there are, you know, I think my observation is that those organizations that are implementing scenario analysis and risk assessments are building scenarios and then using those subsequently to test risks, to test and identify and surface risks and opportunities. There is a lot of interplay between risks and drivers and scenarios. So bearing that in mind, I think it's important as we build um, these methodologies going forward. So um, I just wanted to mention that. So there's a bit of context around scenario planning and uh, what I thought I'd do now and uh, is step through a range of steps on how to go about this at the entity level and some things to think about building on what um, Andy has set out around the reference scenarios. And this is uh, some stuff that we've been, I guess, learning and keen to share and also ultimately get some feedback on. If, uh, and I know many of you on the call are doing this in your work as well. So. First, first up, there's a load of guidance out there. I've just put a few on screen and and again, the XRB have developed some great guidance there and there's TCFD guidance in the middle and also a range of books, one of which we reference quite often is Nadia Haig's work on um, uh, scenario planning for climate change. So just beginning with this, I think at there, there are different tiers and the architecture by which you build your scenarios. Um, just let me, sorry. Yeah. Um, sorry, just hiding my controls here. So the architecture by which you build your scenarios needs to consider a tier one or a global context, which Andy has spoken about, your tier two, which might be your New Zealand context, and tiers that sit under that, and that might be the sector context or your entity itself. And each of those need to be internally consistent or have some alignment, and that, that is challenging. And, I, you know, your New Zealand context, for example, might relate needs to relate to the global context. It might draw on Climate Change Commission um, uh, information, projections, uh, scenarios. It might draw on population stats. It might draw on GDP projections, uh, national climate direction, tatidity, uh, te Māori considerations, et cetera, within your, your New Zealand context. And that's um, important to consider as you move into your sector and entity levels as well. Now, I've going to quickly talk through these steps if we've got time. So these are some 
I guess, pretty common steps. And I've modified some of these a little bit, which will hopefully spur some, some questions and, and comment as we go through. So number one, we want to agree our focal question of our scenario planning and what is our value chain or our scope of what we're looking at. And that's really important. Uh, number two is we want to agree our initial reference scenarios. Again, pointing to what Andy's spoken about, or we might call those archetypes. So what are we looking at? Uh, we're, we're required to look at a, uh, a 1.5 aligned and a greater than three. So those are two quote unquote archetypes that we need to look at. Now, what reference scenarios are we going to use to underpin those? Are we going to use SSP, SSP 1-1.9, SSP 1-2.6? Are we going to use an IEA or an NGFS scenario? And these are all things to consider um, and, and being clear on why we're choosing one. We then move to number three, which is um, doing some research, identifying and uh, driving forces, and then ranking those. And there's methods, qualitative methods to rank those driving forces to uh, make sure that you whittle those down to a manageable number when you start to build your scenario narratives. Number four uh, includes a couple of points there, A and B. So I've said uh, here, you wanna, interestingly, we wanna, through that process of identifying drivers, we might come up with additional archetypes that are relevant to your organization. So there's a bit of a circular uh, or a pause point here to go, what have we learned through this driver identification? That might mean we need to add or additional clarity around these uh, these archetypes that we're thinking about. And I'll come back to that. Then 4B is undertaking more research as we want to map and think how the drivers are going to manifest under these different worlds we're talking about, the different archetype worlds, and finally drafting those narratives and creating your, your text. And what we're not going to talk about today, but is really important, is using scenarios. And this is very critical and interesting at the same time. 99% of effort I've heard is goes into building scenarios and 1% or, you know, maybe it's 2 or 3% goes into using them. And there is, uh, I think, uh, a dearth or a, a, a huge amount of information on building scenarios and very little around how to use them within an organization to test strategies. Um, there's a new book out by Thomas Shermack, which is specifically talking about how to use scenarios and giving, giving methods and ideas on how to do that. So I'm going to talk through these steps really quickly. So first up, simplistically, we need to agree on the focal question. And at one level, that's relatively straightforward, but it is really helpful to keep coming back to this because people within scenario building exercises can, you know, go off track or get distracted and coming back to the question that you've set. And it might be something like, how could climate change plausibly affect our organization by a certain date? And that is, you know, it's a simple question and, and you don't necessarily need to complicate it more than this. However, um, coming back to this is important. You also then need to think about the breadth and depth or particularly the breadth of, of your value chain. Um, are you just looking, um, you know, uh, you, you'll have your organization, you'll have your supply chains that might um, be inputs to your organization. You might have your markets or customers and having a process by which you map that clearly and then assessing how material are those elements within your the scope of the assessment or your value chain that you want to consider within your scenario planning. And that's a, a very important step that the XRB sets out as well and, and um, just wanted to highlight. So that's your focal question and the value chain piece. Then we've got this step I think is important to say, okay, which what are our initial scenario archetypes and how, what are we going to use in this regard? And we know the XRB have said a 1.5 and a greater than three. So what are those? And what, what are the headline kind of statements that we want to draw on? And what are we going to anchor those off? And you might say, right, we want to, we, we want to use SSP 1-2.6 or 1-1.9 and SSP 3 on the other side, 3-7. And what do those mean? And making sure that you understand clearly what those worlds say and the narratives that underpin those. And it might be, say, on the left here, your first archetype might be an aggressive transition. So the, this implies and that the entire world, including New Zealand, aggressively transitions and that global warming is limited to 1.5 through stringent climate policies and innovation, reaching global net zero CO2 emissions around 2050. This might be what you establish as your overarching assumptions that you then build out your uh, New Zealand and your sectoral level assumptions within that. 
so it's very important to grapple with these archetypes. So I guess these reference scenario and and, um, and the assumptions within them at this early stage to take those forward. And similarly, the hothouse is, is probably less controversial. It's where you know uh, global emissions might continue to grow unabated due to a failure of key policies. Uh, and again, you, you might assume New Zealand and the and the entire world are working in unison. Or as Andy mentioned, there are many plausible outcomes possibly in a hot out world when New Zealand does try and decarbonise and the rest of the world does not. Whether you think that's plausible or not is, is another question. So again, it's been quite clear on what New Zealand's role in in, the, in terms of what the globe is doing and establishing that early on so then you can move through the, the detailed steps that, that follow. And, and just to close this off, uh, I've got the icons on the right with the IPCC, the NGFS and the IEA, and they all provide uh, reference scenarios, as Andy has said. If, depending on the focus of your organisation, you need to be careful that, because each of them have different assumptions in them, particularly when you come to the mitigation and the energy mix and what the assumptions are in there as well. So they they aren't necessarily consistent with each other. So it becomes a little bit uh, I think conceptually incorrect to say we're aligning with IPCC and NGFS because that th those two things have implicitly different assumptions in them, or IPCC and IEA. So you kind of have to grapple with that, um, I think, and choose one, in my opinion, over over the others, and 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 move from there. So moving on. So we've spoken about our focal question. We've started to think about our core archetypes. Then we say, right, we want to identify what driving forces and do some research on those that are relevant to our organization. Um, and there's methods to do this. And uh, one sort of framing for this is using the steep categories, social, technological, economic, environment, and political. And this is from the TCFD um, to identify, to, to use as, as categories to help your thinking when you're identifying drivers. And what are drivers? So drivers are factors that are external to an organization that they have no control over. And they should be written in ideally in a neutral way. So a driver might be a change in policy or a driver might be in maybe a specific policy or a driver might be um, uh, a change in sentiment of customers. A driver might be a climate hazards themselves, so increasing temperatures or sea level rise, et cetera. So those are those are drivers and you want to capture what those drivers could be and how important um, and impactful they are. And I'll come to that next. Drivers can be tricky to pin down and you'll find yourself identifying a whole bunch of potential drivers and then you need to question, well, are these the actual drivers or do I need to move up a, up a notch to go, what is actually driving this thing that we're, we're, we're talking about? And that's a, an important step as being quite um, rigorous around identifying the actual drivers rather than outcome statements, which are quite often people put forward outcome statements. For example, um, uh, increased uh, increased use of electric vehicles in New Zealand, right? That might be as someone put forward that as a driver. Well, you might say, well, okay, what would drive the increased use of electric vehicles in New Zealand? It could be policy. So the policy driver, it could be uptake, it could be price. So you, it, it's it's really, I think, important to just query those and make sure you're identifying what those what the key drivers are. And lastly, drivers can interact and with other drivers and with risks and opportunities. So it's it's through this process you want to be thinking about that as you go forward. Um, to that, there, there will be many points of interaction between drivers as well. Um. I'm going to skip over that, and if we've got time, we can come back to it. But it was really just a, an, an example of how these uh, drivers can be difficult to to pin down. So I want to move to step three now. So once you've got a whole whiteboard of drivers with post-it notes or however you're doing it, you then need to say, well, how do we make sense of these? And how do we decide which ones are more relevant than others? And there's a, a simple method to do this, which the, um, has been used in many contexts, the TCFD and, and XRB have, have put this forward. So you're basically trying to say, what is the level of impact for each of the drivers you've identified, which is the vertical axis, and how uncertain are those? Now, the impact is relatively straightforward. Um, is this material and important for your organization? The uncertainty rating, however, is, is quite tricky because it's not asking you what is the probability of this driver playing out. 
it is saying um, uncertainty is low if something almost certainly will or won't happen. Whether uncertainty is high is if we've actually got no idea. And if you go back to that that very first slide I had with the sort of sun shape with the arrows pointing in all different directions, we actually don't know how this will play out. That is So that is high uncertainty. So if I'll give you an example, if you were... Um, say a trucking company and you were say a key driver for us was the future of transport fuels you'd say is that high is that of high importance absolutely our business depends on transport and, and moving logs around so it would automatic it would be a high importance and be in this top band then you say well how uncertain is that the future of transport fuels and you know well it could be we've done some research and it could be uh hydrogen power vehicles could be bio, uh, it could be electric trucks it could be some other um, combination of um, biofuels etc or in fact we could stick with fossil fuels potentially so you've got right there two three or, or four different uh, ways that could play out so you really don't know so that would be an example of something that would be high impact and high uncertainty whether whereas if you said right we're, we're 90 percent sure that things are going electric for trucking, then you'd still say it was high impact, but you'd have it maybe less uncertain because you know the direction it's traveling in. So hopefully that makes sense. And overall, the purpose of this exercise is to get every is a portion of your drivers in the white box here and you note them down and you move on. So you want to whittle down that list. So then moving on to the next stage is saying, now we've identified some drivers and we've rated them, how do they play out under these different worlds that we started thinking about at the beginning? So we had our aggressive transition world, we had our hothouse world, and we could say, well, in a and if we've got a um, say one of our drivers is is fossil is fuel for transport, how might that play out? And we need to come up with a plausible story relevant to our organisation that that is consistent for that driver in that world. And this is just a way to organise your thinking in a. And I'm, in my opinion, it, it's worked well for us is, is just building a matrix approach, if you like, to start thinking about how initially how these, these might play out. And later on, you can think about interactions and use your creativity to come up with some, some you know, much more involved narratives. But this is a more systematic way that, that is helpful. So you're thinking about how these drivers play out under these archetypes. And now this is where what I said at the beginning, you've got a third archetype or a fourth one. Uh, if through this process, you want to really focus on the drivers that you put in this top right-hand box. And you might have a couple in there that you think these are really, they obviously are really important because you've ranked them and they're highly uncertain. These are ones that you want to discuss and think, do they, are they um, uncertain enough to mean we need to create a new archetype that is centered around those highly impactful drivers? And they might be, you might have an aggressive transition if you're a trucking company using hydrogen and you might have an aggressive transition if we use electric vehicle, that might be, you might decide that that merits developing a second scenario because those two are so um, important for your organization and, and divergent in terms of what your strategy needs to be that you need to test both of those. Um, but I think the, the, the idea is really focusing on what's in this blue box to think are those helpful enough to create these these are um, do they give you some pointers as to what these additional archetypes could be as permutations of a transition for example in different directions some of you will be doing orderly and disorderly um, permutations and that's fine that's really saying how does the rate and pace of policy change New Zealand and global payouts so your driver really there is is almost implicit that you're saying that in this box is the rate, the, the, the sort of pace and, and nature of, of policy change. So you've got an orderly and a disorderly. Some people are doing that. Um, and if that's helpful for your planning, then then by all means, that's, that's worth looking at. Then there's a sort of step in here around considering interactions, as I mentioned. Really useful step to think about how these drivers and outcomes can interact. And lastly, you need to put pen to paper and start writing this up and, and creating some some stories uh, that build on uh, the drivers and the outcomes. And this is where you can be pretty creative and start, um, you know, 
working as a group to think how these can be challenging for your organization. So that's that's pretty much the step through I wanted to I wanted to um, walk you through. I've got some summary points here and then we'll we'll open up for questions. Um, first up, we are all learning and and this is early stages and I think there's been some great um, work by the sectoral scenario. People have been doing those and sharing what their learnings have been and the scenario reports that, that are available online and people can go and go and look at those. So I encourage everybody to have a look at, at what's been published to date. Um, there are some important technical alignment and consistency elements. And this is really points again to what Andy said out at the beginning, especially with these reference scenarios. So I think, um, and this is a, maybe a point for discussion when we wrap up is, uh, should we all be using the same reference scenarios? Um, and what is the pros and cons of, the, of, of, of doing that? Um, so there's a, an, an, an understanding as far as possible what's embedded within those reference scenarios so you can not be inconsistent with those when you're doing your uh, national and your element level ones. The process and some of the concepts are key. Uh, this is around uh, the sort of driver language, the identification of drivers, transition physical risks, how to and what you how you build these scenarios and then how you use them. So there's there's a lot in there as well. I'd encourage people to allow enough time for discussion and also research and and recognizing that a lot of organizations or sectors are are time constrained, budget constrained, but um, you know research is important. We're we're working with some health sector um, stakeholders at the moment, and we're finding it's really important to go away and do some research to make sure we we can uh, really provide some evidence base to the drivers and how they will play out and some and what historic trends have been and what's happening internationally, et cetera. And finally, we just need to get started. And I know many of you have, but just a, 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 I guess a plug there and, and um, don't feel nervous about this. You've, uh, scenario planning is, isn't a science, it's more of an art, but there are some important parts to, to grapple with and, and, and build on over time. So I'll stop there and I'll hand back to you, Patty, and welcome the discussion. Thanks. Thanks, James. That's really useful to see the practical, how, how we put this, some of this this uh, theory into, into practice. Really useful. Um, yep, we've got a, a few questions I'd like to pick up on before we get into a, a wider discussion. Uh, Duncan's got a question. Any advice for small and medium enterprises interested in scenario planning but lacking the resource to do it justice? Um, I can come in on that one if you want, Jane. Or... Yeah, yeah. Yep. I guess just from my side, I'd say if, if it's not, if you're not in the space of mandatory reporting, then use it to broaden your thinking about plausible futures. Just use it as an opportunity to start the conversation, start seeing the range of plausible futures. And I also think we, we've seen so far sometimes a bit of an imbalance in thinking about transition and physical risks. Um, it's quite easy for people to think about physical risks and not really realise the implications, particularly of some of the, the rapid transition scenarios and what those really could mean for an organisation. So I'd see it as an opportunity really to explore and you know, kind of cut your cloth a bit and realize how much time you've got of your senior staff and um, sort of create a space where there's enough time, but recognize that in, in, in reality, you might be constrained and work out what you can do in that time. I think it's easy to bite off more than you can chew in this space. And then you're trying to get everything. You're trying to cover everything that you've just heard from James in, in an hour um, with senior staff gets, gets almost impossible. And it can be a bit of a turn off eventually because you don't get to a to an end point. Uh, anything to add on that, James? Uh, look, I, yeah, and I, I, I acknowledge that it can seem quite complex and overwhelming, the process, or I guess the things you need to consider. Um, but I think there are no right and wrong answers to this. I think if an organisation starts starts small and and you know does what they can do and builds complexity over time, I think I think that's the way to go. You know, um, yeah, I'll leave it there. So Alison has a question. How and when can these scenarios be used in practice once you've, so once you develop them? I guess that's moving move into the scenario analysis space. Yeah, look, that's a great question, Alison. And I, as I sort of said, I think we're sort of slowly entering that phase now where organizations are grappling with how they use them. I think there are, there are two ways 
at a high level, you can use them um, if they're done well. One is to test risks and opportunities, if, uh, but more broadly, it's it's about using them in, in ways that can help shine light on gaps in organization strategies. And so if you ran a workshop, for example, and got your senior leadership team or your your, your team to review the scenarios that have been developed and then said, how would our current strategies perform under these different scenarios and what would cause them to fall over? And can we, you know, basically having a, immersing yourself in those, um, in those worlds and given your knowledge of your organization, trying to grapple with what, uh, A, what it would mean if that played out, um, what would work, what, what, what might not. But secondly, I think there's an important point around, um, over time, what are some things that might crop up? Signals, if you like, if you can think of them as as uh, newspaper headlines that might appear that said that might signal to you that we're potentially on a path following our scenario one that we developed that allows you to kind of have that foresight to notice those things as they emerge and then ideally have plans in place that might allow you to um, respond. So that's some thoughts anyway. Thanks, James. And a kind of related question from Perry here. Um, how might we encourage more wide use of scenarios? So he's kind of building on your point earlier that you said that um, most of the effort is going to development. I mean, is that is that because of where we're at with the with the process, or is that kind of also a, a lack of guidance or support in in actually then turning that into in, in applying those in in practice? Yeah, I I, I think it's both of those factors. I, I really do, and I think um, we probably need to reconvene with people who are interested in a year or two and see how organisations have been using them. And that's that's probably the, a good test for all of us. And the XRB will be super interested in that. Um, you know, the amount of effort that's going into building them are they decision relevant? Are they being useful? And how are they being used? Um, so, you know, they're out there now, especially the sector ones. And um, I'm not sure if anyone on this call wants to jump, put something in the chat around how they've been using them. That'd be appreciated. Yeah. We've actually got a question that relates to that, actually, uh, from Lucy. Uh, for an organisation that's participated in the sector-wide scenario, what would you see as the most important steps to then relate that back into the organisation, into this? So, yeah, the, this is a good question. So I think it depends on, on each sector. Where the sectors are narrower, i.e. Um, thinking out loud here, like the tourism sector potentially, you know, you've, you've probably got quite a, 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 a um, intuitive and strong alignment between a business that might sit within the sector and the sector scenario itself, where you've got a lot of divergence within a sector. And I'm thinking maybe of the property and construction sector here, we've got, you know, you've got everyone from, you know, the Fletcher constructions through to um, um, infrastructure organizations through to aged care each of those are quite divergent. So there's, I think, a process there of downscaling or, or using the sectoral scenarios to probably need to go into a bit more detail at your own organization. But again, that's that's my personal view. Um, but you definitely would want to leverage some of the findings of those sector scenarios where relevant. Um, again, you want to, I know that a lot of this can take time if, so that that's the balance, right? And I, going back to, I think it was Duncan's point, that small and medium enterprises are, um, struggle for time to do this. So I think in summary, really reviewing critically what the sector or scenarios capture in terms of drivers, I think is the first step. And then saying, you know, doing a, a, a quite an efficient process of saying, what are some key drivers within our organization that sits within that sector that we might think and have those been captured well enough and if not you might need to do some more work great thanks james um, i'm going to leap back up to a comment a, a question that jack actually asked at the end of andy's question so i don't Andy's session so i don't know whether this is this could be for either of you to answer uh, but what is your view on how well more positive socioeconomic tipping points on the mitigation side are built into the scenarios. And this is interesting because what we're seeing is essentially exponential curves on impacts and on um, renewables uptake, for example. So we're seeing 
tipping points on, on, if you like, on both sides of things, both on the mitigation and on the the impacts, and and how well have how well have those been reflected to date? And also, maybe the question would be then, what happens next as we see those those some of Andy's graphs? I think were showing how kind of these these tipping points are potentially there and potentially outstripping what we expected. Oh, I'll give a quick answer. So um, the, I mean, all the scenarios, the, all the formal scenarios are produced by economic models and economic models tend to struggle with social tipping points and behavior change. They, they solve based on economic equations. Um, so that they're not great for that, um, which is where you would might, want to do more scenario so more sensitivity testing rather than expecting a whole scenario that is, that assumes that it's probably worth adding that to limit warming to 1.5 degrees it's no longer a question of social economic tipping points because even the existing fossil fuel infrastructure is enough to push the world well above 1.5 degrees so it's no longer that you, you would need a willingness to prematurely retire existing capital investments and in infrastructure in order to limit warming to, to 1.5 degrees, which probably goes beyond a social tipping point, but it's highly relevant to the more intermediate worlds where the world might be limping along and suddenly you see a step change that certainly isn't going to be produced by an economic model that assumes more or less smooth driver cha drivers of, of, of change. So that's, that's worthwhile thinking through, but I wouldn't do it as a scenario, more as a sensitivity. What about if that happens faster and what would that precipitate as part of a more comprehensive scenario analysis. Thanks, Eddie. Thanks for that. It's very, very, very helpful. Um, yeah, we have one more question. Uh, the MFE proposes, so this is from David, MFE proposes guidance on scenarios which councils use for future planning. How useful are these in the context of socioeconomic impact assessment and business case development for risks and opportunities, comparing one scenario against another? Have you got any thoughts on that one, James? Just reading it again. How is for this? Yeah, I mean, this is uh, this is for councils. So, I think it's important to understand what the scenarios are for. And if we're talking about climate scenarios in this case, or more socioeconomic scenarios, um, assuming this is relating to climate change only i mean because just as an aside you know councils or organizations can build scenarios on a range of topics using uh, this this type of approach whether it's urban development whether it's socioeconomic change etc so for climate i th i think they would be useful in terms of economic socioeconomic risk uh, impact assessments and business cases to test uh, and i've actually seen some guidance in australia more in the infrastructure space where they've said when you do you know suggesting for for business cases for projects that you want to test them against a range of scenarios to see how they perform um using a, a sort of process that that we've been talking about today so yeah i, th I think there is opportunity there for, for sure thanks james I'm afraid we've hit the 1.30 um, stop and I, I realise you're all very busy people so I, I don't want to impose on, on your time any, any more than we, we agreed to. So I'd just like to thank uh, my two speakers today, uh, James and Andy, for your, providing your insights. I know some of the comments are already coming through that it's been hugely informative so thanks so much for your inputs and thanks for everybody's time. Um, we do have a really super short survey that will automatically come up um, in a moment. Um, we really would appreciate if you take the time. It's a couple of clicks here and there. It's really not a long or arduous thing. Um, so that will pop up anytime soon. Um, but yeah, other than that, thanks so much for your time. And uh, as I say, we're hoping to run a number of scenarios, a number of scenarios, <laughs> um, a number of sessions of this type um, in the future, um, because we think there's so much to explore here. A number of issues have already been sort of inspired on a number of the comments already to to kind of look look into future topics. But do do keep your eyes out, and if you want to be on our mailing list, do give us a call, and uh, and we'll make sure we get you hooked in for the for the next webinar. Thank you so much. <laughs>